Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we can sit Hello. back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the things going on in Linux, open source, all that fun stuff. I'm Vince Stone, joined every week. That is a Joel Bryant in the big pink headphones. Look <laughs> at them. They're so big <laughs> and so pink. Yes. <laughs> and the guy who enjoys wearing t-shirts that anger and confuse video processing units, Pedro Mateus. Mm. Oh, Hello. <laughs> I like his Jaws line art. <laughs> <laughs> the moray pattern, man. So, yeah, we had some late breaking news, <laughs> like right before the show. We're going to get into that, along with some other things. Uh, I got a new thing I have did for some audio stuff I want to share with you. But before that, we got to play a little catch up and see what's going on, because I got <laughs> some new toys. I sure do. I got oh. one big new toy. <laughs> this is what... A $900 box looks like, kids. <laughs> Look at that. That's what you get. Mm. <laughs> they, they put some padding on the inside. <laughs> oh, okay. At least it's pink, so you know it's anti-static. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I thought I would never get my hands on because I refused to pay the iron price for it. This is um, the Magewell. Well, this is the box for it. The Magewell is currently in the system testing a, a quad HDMI and they are ridiculously expensive. But I always wanted to like give one a proper Linux shakedown. Fantastic deal I got on one. Thank you, Dell. Because Dell bought a lot of these and that procurement company had been sitting on them for two years and they're like, hey, we're gonna put these on fire cell. Which I got one. <laughs> We've learned a lot about it, just playing around with it for the past week, using it right now. My video is coming through that. Jill's video is coming through that. Pedro's video is coming. We got room for one more. Plus, I got another capture card in the system from Blackmagic sending their video out. Pretty solid piece of kit. It's got some issues, but nothing that we can't overcome. Very happy to uh, be able to like just lay that out. Here's some like real information with this piece of hardware that... A sane person would never have it used for, but I thought Pedro would love it, man, because it, it can capture at 144p, not 144, 144 that, frames a second. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that would be uh, actually very, very, very nice. But I don't have even on fire sale three hundred dollars. <laughs> no, can't afford that right now. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I have uh, money set aside, but that's for a GPU at some point. <laughs> you know what? The Very origin good. story of this was me just getting tired. That's what I was talking about last week. It's like, I'm tired of constantly checking new wag and every other. I'm like, can I, can I get a 3060 like for under 400 bucks? I'm like, you know what? Uh -huh. Next year, next year, I'll just ride this 2060 out because <laughs> it would help if I could get a 3060. Um, but I can live without it. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you very much, Wimpy. That uh, that 1080 is going to be kicking on to year six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's new with you, Jill? You got anything fun going on? Yes, I do. So, as as you know, I've been I've been uh, in the process of remodeling my computer room, and when really? I bring I everything, you were in the process of trying to buy a bunch of stuff to match your pink headphones. Yes. Well, there's that too. So in, in doing that, when I uh, get the room all painted and carpeted and cabinets and, and shelving up, um, I am going, I have some new equipment to go with that. And one is this pretty new 60% uh, pink keyboard. I've, I've had pink mechanical keyboards before and uh, I have a Bluetooth one I'm using now, but there is something unique about this one. Uh, it's actually not mechanical. This is a membrane keyboard. <laughs> so it's nice and quiet for when I'm doing podcasting and, and that makes Ben happy. 60% <laughs> though. That, 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 that's no. <laughs> I, I love these. You know, I, I've gotten used to using them because I use one in, in, uh, on another computer. So I just love them because they take up very little space. And I've gotten used to, you know, hitting a few extra buttons to do some functions. So... Uh, yeah, no. Uh, you'll take my cursor keys uh, when you chop off the fingers off my right hand. Pedro, Pedro, there's oh. absolutely, positively <laughs> nothing wrong with that style yeah. of keyboard to give to someone that you Aww. do not like. Yeah. 
I no for me yeah. no. <laughs> well, it's funny because you know, like Steve husband was pointing out, my hands are really tiny, so these keyboards are perfect, perfect for me. And again, this one isn't. You know, I've I've spent a lot of money on some really good, you know, mechanical keyboards that are sixty percent, and it's nice to get something that's you know relatively inexpensive, but does the job, but doesn't have all the noise. So when I'm broadcasting, I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> So. <laughs> I guess in that same vein, I too have uh, gone back to membrane keyboards, specifically the um, Logitech G15. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that works. It's, uh... <laughs> I'm going to have to buy a mechanical it, it, keyboard just out of spite now. <laughs> oh, Ben. <laughs> My only complaint with this particular keyboard is, is that there is no Portuguese layout. Oh. None was ever made, or oh. Spanish, or a bunch of other languages. It's just UK English or US English. That's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need my accents and my uh, C with a sedilla. I need all of that. Because okay. you're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's talk about what like, went down right before mm-hmm. we went live. Oh, this, this is some of that good old-fashioned juicy guns. This is from Neowin. Linux bans University of Minnesota for sending buggy patches in the name of research. That is right. And wow. Yeah, Greg. You might know him. From the Colonel mailing list, he's just banned the entire mm-hmm. University of Minnesota from any contributions in the future. Uh, basically, what boiled down is they did a research paper on the feasibility of stealthily introducing vulnerabilities into open source software. You'll never guess what they picked. Mm-mm. Uh, well, <laughs> they didn't ask if they could do this when they were submitting these uh, patches, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so a lot of extra work is having to be done to clean up that nonsense. And Greg has the opinion that, you know, submitting known patches uh, that either do nothing or with the purpose of introducing bugs. He seems to think that's a little bit bad, guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just like, yeah. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> to which I'll say to whoever, I really, I'm not quite, I, we don't even know the full story, but from what is there and reading through the um, kernel mailing list, I mean, it looks like, you know, a researcher or a group of researchers in an effort to advance their professional careers to um, do this and publish a paper about it caused a lot of unnecessary work for people trying to get stuff done. Boo. Um, however, Greg has introduced us. So we said the scorched earth policy for the entire university, which also makes me sad because there are people there that absolutely want to submit patches to the kernel and like, Hey, we want to help out, but can't risk it at this point. And, you know, at the, at the end of his, uh, Here's the post itself. I, I really like going through this. You, you get the uh, plonk from Greg. And if you're unfamiliar with, with the plonk, <laughs> that's the yeah. mic drop because they did have the audacity to come back. I have one of the guys involved and he's like, this, this is borderline defamation that you... That, Slander. Oops. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> that went dumb. Now, I was looking over some of them bits that they were reverting and like six of the patches were for Ulsa. For those who like thinking, this couldn't wouldn't affect anything. I'm doing it very well, Cun. Right mm-hmm. there. Um, two of them were for the uh, DRM Radiant stack. So, mm. and immediately I'm thinking, have I been battling an audio bug because of this nonsense? I just, hey, oh. very well, good, Ben. <laughs> I mean, at best case scenario, uh, you've been battling a patch commit that did nothing that just introduced fluff to the kernel and at worst case it introduced a massive security hole but yeah no welcome to how to get an entire university's worth of kernel contributions reverted and blacklisted 101 your professor this semester will be greg crow hartman (laughs) because (laughs) yeah no I read through the thread and there was uh, another uh, kernel contributor there is like what's the story behind this and they posted the, um, someone else posted the link to the PDF that's behind this research. And then, of course, the person who made the original patch came back, ah, oh, this is borderline slander, you should cease and desist. Uh, these accusations, like, 
I, you don't do that. And you, I think you got lucky that it was Greg who picked that up mm. because if it had been Linus, things would have gone a little bit differently for you. Just yeah. saying. <laughs> so true, Pedro. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so true. So uh, Greg Crow Hartman, uh, one of my favorite quotes he, he, he stated was, our community does not appreciate being experimented on and being tested by submitting known patches that are either do nothing on purpose or introduce bugs on purpose. If you wish to, to yep. do work like this, I suggest you find a different community to run your experiments on. You are not welcome here. Yay. <laughs> so. Seriously. Really, really well done, Greg. I would use another word right now, but this is uh, Wednesday, so uh, bad arse. Yeah, I, I really hope this is just a case of one bad actor and other people, or maybe a few bad actors. I, but what do you do when you're in that position? Because you can't just start picking and choosing anything that is coming from that university, like it or not, has to be suspect. It's got to be mm -hmm. sus. And, I, I, and there's <laughs> clear evidence to show that they are, in fact, doing that. Yeah, it's the paper so, they published saying, yeah. hey, we did this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're just going to stop right here. <laughs> it's a bad yeah, situation and, and, for everyone involved, and especially everyone that's having to go back and deal with this right now, because now you got things and, yeah. and, uh, and uh, people have real work to do, not cleaning up your experiment mm -hmm. so you could publish a paper. Yeah. Good job. And then like me and you were talking about earlier, you know, it's sad for the students because they don't get the, you know, the credit to put on their resume that they contributed to the kernel because of this whole fiasco. You got somebody sitting there like, hey, that looks <laughs> good on your CV and you're going to be pushing the not, not anymore, not from that EDU address. And it's just basic common courtesy with my limited experience with um, penetration testing that is drilled into you of, hey, the difference between breaking and entering and doing pen testing is letting the owner of the building or the company know that you're going to be trying to get in. Um, a lot of this could mm -hmm. have been solved picking up the banana phone and like, hey, we'd like to conduct this. Here's the list of the uh, patches that we expect to, you know, put some futs in. And uh, you mind if we do that? Might have been like, uh, maybe <laughs> not. But this is one of those instances where it was better to ask for permission instead of beg for forgiveness yeah. yeah even if you ask it's like can you keep this on the down low we're trying to prove something but ask first mm. please <laughs> bad news yeah. but we do have some good news the most current breakneck Yay. distribution known to humanity <laughs> Oh, I'm excited about this. So the oldest Linux distro is still actively maintained. Slackware Linux. Yay. It's alive. And well, with the release of the Slackware Linux 15 beta. Yay. This is really cool. So it's been almost five years since the last Slackware release, uh, Slackware Linux 14.2. And this release just brings lots of upga updates and changes. And what's really cool is the creator of Slackware, Patrick Volkerding, updated it to Linux 5.10 kernel, the GCC <laughs> compiler 10.3, in the system library, glibc 2.33. <laughs> Wonderful. But something else is actually really, really cool. Um, he upgraded KDE to Plasma 5.21.4. Yeah, that's, that's that's a very recent like release. Like a version out. It's, yeah, yeah, that, that that's very recent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and also KDE applications five point eight one dot zero and XFCE four point sixteen. So you know, it's really nice that he's brought all the uh, modern software updates with it. And, uh, you know, this has been one of my favorite Linux distros of all time. And it's actually the one that started me, my Linux journey back in 1993. So I got love, love for Slackware. <laughs> yeah, the ISO is currently still not available for testing, but there is an unofficial one that you can go and uh, get for yourself. <laughs> the the 2016 was the, uh, the last release, 14.2. Uh, <laughs> that was five years ago. That's an eternity in software development time. That Pedro, Pedro, not every <laughs> distribution can operate at the breakneck pace that is Debian. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I was going to make a send OS joke, but I can't because streams is a thing now. Yeah. <laughs> I think like a lot of people, um, I started with Slack where before, well before the first point release, mainly because it was small and we were using floppies and we had really bad internet and I could download it and get it up and running. It's a good time. Exactly. <laughs> I stuck with Slack until the first versions of Red Hat. You're a Red Hat shill, Vin. No, I'm not. They haven't cut me a check yet. Uh, and kind of went on from there. I've kind of forgotten about Slackware outside of maybe a brief time in the early 2000s when like, hey, Slack packs, that's kind of a neat system. All right, I'm bored with it. Moving on. I'm glad <laughs> they got an update. And it's nice and current. And yes. I know there's absolutely some Slackware diehards out there. Like there's Gentoo users. Yeah. I know. Well, so it's I'm such not a, gonna, I'm not that say I'm not running on any of my laptops. Negative about so. it because they'll cut you. <laughs> Don't mess uh, with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of the <laughs> fastest distros out there. And it's one um, besides Debian that I like to install on my old machines because it doesn't have system D. So it's it's actually a lot faster <laughs> for those old machines. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you went there. <laughs> yeah. That way I don't have to. <laughs> well, well, it's just it's better for the old machines not to have it. <laughs> we look forward to your hate mail on that. I'm sure no. everyone's got an opinion. Uh, what else do we? Oh, man, we do have some gnome stuff, though. Uh, I, I was happy to see this. Yeah. I, I was happy to see this because... Nothing makes me happier than watching Pedro complain about Gnome. <laughs> due to his rabid KDE fanboyism, uh, allow me to present Pedro Mateus's unbiased opinion about Vertical Overview. <laughs> uh. So uh, it may seem strange that we're going to be talking about a Gnome extension, specifically the Vertical Overview Gnome extension, which uh, is uh, currently very much in development, according to Ren Zalthuis, uh, who is the developer. And uh, yeah, it's... Yet another instance. So uh, with GNOME 40, they decided to change how the um, workspaces were laid out. They used to be laid out vertically in GNOME uh, 3.0 on the right side of the dashboard. They changed that. And look, if you've been paying attention to the show, because I know I haven't, uh, the, <laughs> we talked a couple of months ago uh, when we first talked about the GNOME 40 that they weren't, they deliberately said that they would not be giving people the option to go back to the old layout. That was a decision that they made which at the time I deliberately pointed out that that was a bad idea that's not something you want to do but then again this is GNOME we're talking about. They did it with GNOME 3 so it made sense that they would do it with GNOME 4 or 40 whatever they mm -hmm. call it. Uh, so it begins now um not only do you need extensions to add basic functionality itself, you need extensions to add back functionality that GNOME, within technically the same platform, decided to remove. Good job! That's amazing! <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my first response to this when I saw it was, if you want that GNOME shell classic look... <laughs> <laughs> this is going to replace this will replace uh our feelings when uh you know we got gnome 3 and wanted to go back to gnome classic <laughs> so, yeah it, it's yeah. exactly the same thing all yeah. over again <laughs> it is and um what's also cool is a uh, system 76 new gnome based desktop cosmic which we talked about last week will keep actually the vertical workspaces even when they update it to gnome 40 so that's a thing. So you can use a Pop OS <laughs> if you'd like. <laughs> well, you could have. Yep, they are working on their own GNOME fork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people went absolutely ballistic. The type of people who get genuinely upset about this as opposed to saying, well, I'll just use this other, you know, because there's only two desktop managers on Linux. Um, <laughs> the horizontal workspaces, when GNOME 3 came out, people flipped out. Like, ah. But just like that, hey, look, there's a plugin. If you want to stick with GNOME, <laughs> if you're down for some of that Stockholm syndrome, go for it. Throw this in. You're back. You to have it. to use extensions anyway. So what's right. more? Right. <laughs> and I, I, I want to put a positive spin on that. That's part of the customization of GNOME itself. It's like everything's kind mm -hmm. of an extension. You want to do this thing? 
throw this thing on. Now, I'll agree that yeah. it's very cumbersome, out-of-the-box experience, but it is tweakable, Pedro. Uh, it is now, uh, because when GNOME 3 first came out, extensions were not officially supported. Mm. You needed a third-party tool to uh, enable and disable them and configure them properly. Mm-hmm. So you can applaud them <laughs> on making progress? That's all I'm hearing. <laughs> we did. <laughs> it was... 338 or something like that, that they introduced the official extensions bit that you could set extensions without having to install GNOME Tweak on top of GNOME. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How about KDE? What are your thoughts on that? KDE! Yeah, no, uh, as much as I use Because I, was it last week or the week before last we talked about, um, they they were doing a thing with KDE Neon where they're rolling out automatic unattended upgrades. Some people had an issue with that. And, um, mm-hmm. well, they, they went back and had a think on it. Yeah, they did. Because uh, KD, uh, unlike GNOME, they do listen to people. They may be, like every software Blanket developer, quotes. a bit reticent. Yes. <laughs> they may be a bit reticent to make changes to their product in something that they were very proud of, like the uh, KDE offline updates. But, Enough people kicked up enough of a fuss about you having to reboot every single time there's even a small update in order for it to apply that they decided, you know what, let's just make this optional. And they have many flaws. KWIN comes to mind. Uh, compositing in KWIN is a dumb joke at this point. Language. Oops. I Mm. used the wrong word. (laughs) But yeah, no, it is an absolute joke at this point, KWIN compositing. But at least they listen to the people, even if people are idiots. But hey, (laughs) I for uh, look, I know, I know it's it's a change. It's different. Therefore, I hate it. I'm not that kind of person. In fact, I thought that offline updates were actually a very good idea. Mostly because the way that most distros do uh, updates in KDE used to actively break a running uh, install, a running installment of KDE. Like, oh, I updated KDE 5 in it. So now KDE 5 in it, whenever I try to start it, it's segfaults. What uses KDE 5 in it? Oh, that's right, everything. So, yeah, that's... This gets works very much around that. And there was still, you know, the option was still there if you wanted to do the regular updates. You just use apt over terminal or synaptic. This is just for discover and PKCon. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know what? You know what? I, I, I'm glad they did this. I am surprised it wasn't an option out of the gate, but... Yeah, that first initial thing, I understand people's blowback with it. Now, I, I said that was like the internet's panicking again over nothing. But <laughs> you, you kind of get where they were coming from. Because, you know, what I'm sitting here, and I think I brought up this example, I have a very strict not broke, don't fix policy. And if everything's <laughs> running fine, I don't want anything to update because then I got to figure out what it was and what update caused the thing to break. I'm not counting security updates. Where would we be on that? What, what if it was only going to force uh, security updates? It, it wasn't forcing anything. No, That's no, no Pedro, One of the things that Pedro, I'm actually... hear what I'm trying to get you to have a conversation about. Yes. <laughs> but if it only did that... If it only did that for the non-security updates and it applied the security updates while the system was still running... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that probably would have made a lot of people a lot less angry, I suppose. Maybe maybe it's always good to have the opt-in policy. I'm like, hey, by default, we're going to push these security updates. I would 100%, 100% be behind that. And like, by the way, if you just want to take care of everything, just hit that tab. You're good. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things I appreciate about KD Neon specifically uh, is that they don't do the automatic updates. You get a little notification. It's like, yo, you have updates waiting. Right. Okay. Yeah, they can sit there, Mm-mm-mm. but doesn't do it automatically. That's nice. <laughs> so you got out a Logitech keyboard for a reason. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, I got out a Logitech uh, on Saturday or on Friday, actually, because uh, you put the uh, GK bind in the notes. 
And uh, GK Byte, we talked about it if you didn't watch the Saturday show. It's a TD tiny little bit of software that lets you uh, basically set the macro keys. The uh, let's see if I can bloop that up. You see the G keys here? These uh, are the macro keys for the Logitech keyboards. And I brought this out because this is the one Logitech keyboard I have. So, all right, let's, uh, let's go poke at the macro keys, see if they do anything. Mm-hmm. This doesn't work with the G15. This is only for more recent, um, a lot, uh, not laptops, keyboards that have um, mostly, I think, the mechanical ones, because those seem to be the per uh, key addressable LEDs, because this works off of the same um, device support list that uh, key LEDs has. So, yeah, since key LEDs does not support my g15 i cannot use this but yeah you can use this for all the other ones that uh no other software at this point supports which is nice i suppose <laughs> i guess i yeah <laughs> I, I mean if you have the extra keys you might have put them to use these on this one actually do work out of the box on linux because thank you kernel developers for <laughs> introducing the driver for this one because yeah you just hit the um the macro keys, and they do things. All right. Right on. Right nice. on. Nice to have those working. I have got tons of Logitech yep. keyboards, and I'm just so used to not using the special keys. <laughs> so it really does nice. seem like the like primary use of those. How long has it been since those have been in production? It's been a minute, hasn't it? Long time. Uh, 90s? This G15 came out <laughs> in... 2005? Mm-hmm. Six? Mm-hmm. Something like that? Okay. So, yeah, it, 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 it's been a while. <laughs> it's good to see support for it. I mean, it's a keyboard. Why throw it away? And hey, it's got that nifty yeah. LCD screen. You can make it do things, right? You can put it, yeah, I, in my case, I have the uh, CPU uh, utilization, the CPU frequency, uh, the memory utilization, but it also counts the cache, uh, the cache memory that you have cool. in use in your yeah. RAM. So I'm currently <laughs> sitting at 90 for, uh, 95% memory utilization. Okay. <laughs> I'm down with that. So I finally got this done. This has been up for patrons for a while, but I wanted to give it a mention because I'm always on the lookout for, you know, just audio interfaces that provide a lot of punch for a little bit of cost because I know people want to play around with stuff and you don't want to go out and the first thing you buy is like an $800 audio interface for your podcast, live stream, or you just want to record some music. And this is the original Apogee, the Apogee one from 2009. You know, back then it wasn't crazy expensive for an Apogee anyway. It was like 200 and 250 bucks. But in 2021, you can snack one of these for about seven. Well, th- I got this one for 30, but realistically, you know, average deal about 75 to a hundred dollars. Why are they so cheap? It's not because they're bad at all. Nay, it's that they were never compatible with windows. And they only work at 441K, 44.1K sampling rate. Now, what I do want to say is, like, even on Macs, current version of uh, Mac OS, they only work at 44.1 instead of 48 under Linux. They work on both. That means that you can get them reasonably cheap, and they're solid pieces of kit. Now, just taking a look, you do get that original Apogee preamp. Nice, warm, clean, 63 dB of gain. So that's going to drive something like your Shure SM7Bs, like microphones like Pedro has. Like <laughs> You're good. It does phantom power if you have a condenser mic. Also, that's nice. 45 dB of gain on your line input. Now, you can only use one at a time. You can't use them both. That's where the duet comes in. And I think most importantly, it's USB, because some of you have an irrational fear of fire noodles. Even though you can just get spectacularly good <laughs> deals on FireWire audio interfaces and not even arguably, they are better suited for recording audio stability-wise than USB. Just got to deal with that. That's a fact. And as I said, it's limited to 48K, but that's going to be great for recording podcasts or live streaming. Go look in your OBS. Where does it stop? 48. So you'll be good. Yeah, I liked it. It's a great little tool and I like Double so that it's USB because it makes it easier for me to give it away. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I, I went looking on eBay. Yeah, the the the, the 
selling price of a working one is anywhere between 70 and 130 pounds. Yeah, I think high as I would go if you got a full one in, you know, not necessarily in box, but you get the breakout cable with it. And really, that's all you need. That the breakout cable, I'd, I'd, I'd max it like 70 pounds on that good condition. And it might again, be something I, if, if one shows up, I'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> yeah. And keep in mind, it's not a sound card, even though I know people are good at that. Included, go to LinuxTeamCast.com. It's right there on the front page. All this is going to be in the show notes, but I know people are going to try it. The most common question I get, it's doing weird things. And like, are you using it as a sound card? Yes. Stop using it as a sound card. But and that's the end of our conversation. <laughs> so <laughs> just keep that in mind but yeah it's a nice piece of kit and i uh, was you know I, just being able to sort this out the only piece of text on the internet as a whole it's like some post like eight years ago i've got one guy saying i think it kind of works is the only information i could find <laughs> oh, wow <laughs> who are you Denver coder 69 yes. <laughs> who are you and what did you see <laughs> that's why i've been on a search for one i'm like well i need to answer that because these do come up for like incredibly cheap and i don't know should you get it or not because you know that's kind of a danger thing to get something that just doesn't work on anything but a mac but hey it turns out we can use linux to keep hardware rocking and rolling especially when it's good hardware Speaking of rocking and rolling, if you want to help us keep rocking and rolling, smooth segue right to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. That's where you can go to help us out. We don't do ads. We got some extra jingle jingle kicking around. That's neat. We invite you. We got some little benefits if you're going to support the show. And uh, that's how we keep everything trucking along, along with the store. If you want to, you know, put us all over your face, chest, and neck, that's an option as well. <laughs> if you want to get the best hardware, the best hardware, eh, you know. <laughs> I may be biased, but yes. <laughs> put our Absolutely. best hardware all over your body <laughs> and so you're going to take that out of context <laughs> Jill owns more of our merch than almost anyone except for me yeah. <laughs> true yes and Jill I right now own nothing <laughs> but you gotta give Jill credit because she owns open merch see I keep it closed so you know I'm a collector <laughs> <laughs> so I keep it in the original pack <laughs> I do have two of some of the shirts and one I don't wear. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Collector's items. Okay. In a few years, they'll yeah. be worth not 30 cents. <laughs> the favorite thing, I still remember this when I was a child. I've never been into comic books too much, but I'd buy the occasional comic book. And uh, it was a Ren and Stimpy comic book that had come out. And it was in a bag. And, you know, I wasn't a fancy child. It's like, it's in a bag. Okay. I'll. And it's Ren and Stimpy, which explains a lot about our broken senses of humor as adults. I'm like, <laughs> go back and watch that original run. You're like, whoa, okay. Yeah, that's why I messed up. Well, partially. That went places. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on the bag, it's like, hurry up, open it. It's great. Uh, it's going to be an awesome. You open it. And on the inside, it's like, I can't believe you opened this, you idiot. You've destroyed the value. It's like, well played. I remember that as a child. Yeah. <laughs> the whole encouraging you to open it and opening the bag. Just called me out on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well done. We have two little pie powered, um, pie sized bits of pie. Starting off with the Quartz 64 AB. I was kind of excited about this. Now, this is just the general um, Pine 64 updates, you know, new developments and all that fun stuff. We've given a mention about the Model A, and then they were talking about the Model B. These mm -hmm. are pie sized arm devices which i'm like okay all right you sporting a rock ship I'm like all right that could be fun well with the updates they've come out and they've said hey the ethernet chip that they plan to use with the model a it's kind of become unavailable it's back ordered right now and they've also increased the price by 850 percent i'm like mm. May not be able to use that one. It wouldn't make economic sense, which I get. I get. I also award, you know, kudos for just coming out and saying this as opposed to we're working on things. Ooh. And um, they also give it a mention that the Model A will be pushed back due to that. And it's probably going to come out closer to the same time the Model B comes out, which is okay. Basically, there's no ETA on either right now. But Pine has a track record of being able to deliver product, which is the most difficult thing out of all of this 
is to get into the hands of consumers. So kudos yep. on that. And they are very much still trying to, well, how do I say this? Be nice about it. Um, they're very much, and we're still trying to get the software to work on the hardware phase of development. Mm. So that should give you an idea of the timeline. Like, we well, well, got it to boot, kind of. <laughs> the uh, PCB and, you know, the single board computer is a thing. Now we just need to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is the point that they're at. <laughs> And the, the pie form factor is massively popular because of the pie. And if you can get something with, you know, proper GPIO out and the screw holes in the same place, hey, guess what? It's going to be compatible with a lot of third party cases out of the blue. So, mm-hmm. y- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm excited to see that. And, you know, that's, I, I understand a lot of the, because um, it wouldn't be the first person to do it in the, Pi form factor. I get why you do that, though, because you have all those cases, all those peripherals. Mm -hmm. And I know it's very tempting, like, you're just knocking them off. Well, you're going to have spare cases, so (laughs) might as well Mm -hmm. reuse it. And (laughs) why not standardize on a form factor for single board computers? I mean, laptops are fairly standard. (laughs) Pedro, I'm a laptop manufacturer. Get wrecked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're all full technically <laughs> Aww. well you know they also said that their their pine tabs are heavily delayed partly because of the pandemic and they're having a hard time getting certain parts so while that's being delayed i'm actually thinking of getting a pine phone soon but in lieu of that uh i just bought a pine book off ebay to start my pine 64 device collection <laughs> Yay! And Steve Husband calls it my. I'm, he, I'm starting my Pine Forest collection. <laughs> yeah, that sounds then, like a, a Steve level joke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pedro, don't encourage him, or else he won't learn. No, 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 no. Uh, I will encourage him. I, I want to see more Steve jokes. Steve yes. jokes uh, <laughs> are very They're nice. Some of the best. But. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that I uh, read is that they're also giving away a bunch of the old original uh, pine books to mm. charities or nonprofits. They or they've already gotten in touch with a few of them, so yeah, basically all of that unsold stock is going to be useful, which is good, which is very mm-hmm. good, very good job, Pine. Uh, as if I wasn't a big enough fan of yours and the Pine Sill and the Pine Book Pro, yeah, good job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Speaking of laptops. Yeah, so this is actually a really cool project. This is a do-it-yourself Raspberry Pi uh, meant to look like a palm top computer, like a mini laptop from days of yours. And it's it's made from found parts around your house or uh, available cheaply from your local discount store. And also, of course, from, uh, from uh, parts for the Raz Pi officially. I got to give a little throw on like right here. We're <laughs> like, Hey, what about the limitations? And they, they come out like, Hey, it's really disheartening. And I've been, I've run into this. Mm-hmm. You know, if you find a really cool project, that's just really inaccessible because of the built requirements. Cause not everyone has yeah. a shot or a mm-hmm. workshop. How many times have you been looking at a like, Oh, this looks great. Oh, step one, go to your CNC machine. You're like, ah, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ben. that's what, you know, the developer, he wanted to make a project that, anyone could really, really build. And, you know, even the um, uh, little lower in the website, uh, he he shows a cheap USB keyboard and tablet case combo that he got for a few bucks. And he started with that. But his inspiration was the classic Pocket PC, which I also have in my collection. I have the HP Pocket PC and a couple of the compacts. And I absolutely love that form factor too. So this is his his love for the palm top and uh, just really, really cool. Um, It's what's really neat is he actually uses um, cardboard as a motherboard chassis in a plastic box. (laughs) Yep. That's a straight up Tupperware. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And, you 
know, many of us computer geeks are guilty of using cardboard for computer cases. So it tracks, right? So yeah, yep. so we got a nice, you know, Raspberry Pi screen and you get the keyboard in the uh, the cheap or tablet portfolio case. And you stick all the parts on cardboard and put it in a plastic box. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, actually modify the case a bit. And uh, just using uh, tape and and scissors, he made a decent looking uh, palm top. <laughs> and it, it's really quite impressive. And you're almost there, Vin, on the bottom of the website. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, if there you look at it like that, it looks a... like somebody put a lot, like some parts in a Tupperware container. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <That's> essentially. <laughs> this is but what happens during nice. pandemics and lockdowns. Yes. <laughs> oh, I have Absolutely. these bits kicking about. Can I do something? Oh, <laughs> wouldn't you know? <laughs> yeah. So but the yeah, end product, it is, you I, know. I, there it is. It yeah, actually looks pretty cool. I really cool. like that idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like that idea. The whole idea of like turning a Raspberry Pi into a laptop. Clearly, I'm not the only one who likes that idea because there was a company, PyTop, that uh, made the mm. Pi Tops. And yes. uh, it's kind it's of a shame out. that they decided, <laughs> yeah, they decided to price it like they did because that means people will have to do this. Pretty yeah. hardware, man. It is expensive. <laughs> but hey, if you want to get in touch with us and let us know about your Pi Powered project or anything else, you got some questions, thoughts, like hints, allegations, things better left unsaid, you name it. We got you covered. We get a contact form. It's under contact. Cleverly just just you'll never find it. Seriously, it's just under contact. No. Pick the right <laughs> topic. That correct topic is LWDW for Linux Wednesday. Weekly, daily. Yes, in that order. I don't care what order you put them in. I'm not going to judge you. WWD? Hey, man. Listen, <laughs> if they can find an alternate <laughs> drop down selection, go for it. I'm just not going to give any promises. <laughs> but real quick, because we're running short on time, I got to get this out. Uh, we had somebody, they wrote us back on Twitter, and that somebody was uh, Pine64. Pine. Pedro, <laughs> what, what instigated this? Yeah, so last week we talked about how a couple of, uh, you know, um, prolific hackers had uh, managed to get some open source firmware running on the modem for the Pine phone. And in their blog post, they did say, this is a third party thing where it's not, you know, official, it's not ours, it's theirs. And we mentioned it and I said that it was a very good idea and it should be a thing and it hopefully will be a great step for the future because... The firmware that's currently running the modem, even on, you know, current gen phones, is beyond antiquated. Uh, so Legal, yeah, no, Pedro. Need... Legal is the word you're looking for. Yes, it's legal. Uh, so for legal reasons, they they have to be very clear. To be clear, we will not ship a custom modem firmware for legal reasons. However, what users do with their Pine phone is none of our business. It's their phone. And that, mm -hmm. the, the, those last three words at the end there, four if you count the contraction as two, uh, the, it's your phone, you know, unlike yeah. Apple awesome. or What they're trying Google. to throw down <laughs> is what everyone just kind of expects, but is not necessarily the case with a lot of stuff that you buy. And they're like, hey, uh, you gave us mm -hmm. money. All of these things are yours now. Do it with them as you will. Mm -hmm. And, um... That, that's yeah. so refreshing to see. Yeah, yeah we yeah. love Pine There's 64 for that. <laughs> yeah, and someone that's else awesome. uh, actually asked them, so were you strong-armed into not providing open source firmware? And they said, no, there's a bunch of countries and international uh, law stipulations that basically require that the firmware remains unaltered. The FCC doesn't like it. A bunch of other uh, regulatory bodies don't like it. So, yeah, the hardware is yours. You do you, boo. But we can't offer that kind of situation. Yeah. yeah. It's good to see. Happy to see. All right. We got to bounce yeah. out of here before the clock ticks <laughs> down to nothing. But before we do that, I'm going to kick on some credits so we can <laughs> Yay! talk over yeah. them. Well, thank you. <laughs> Aww. We get to Straight give up. love to all our people. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> All of the bad things is, is those credits are recorded. We keep the block in the basement. What? <laughs> I couldn't hear you talking over me. Advisor Omegas, thank you. Our advisor and our executive producers, Aldius, Farbrandt, Scott M. Eh, <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> I want my thank you, quick. Darkwing. <laughs> yes. And Jack and Renault and everyone else and Smashly. <laughs> oh, Jill and Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and Aww. Evandro and seriously, you're all amazing. Thank you all very much. This show exists because of you. Yes, I blame you still. Aww. We love you all. <laughs> <laughs>